for about 20 years now, I've been working on the idea that the sun is actually comprised of condensed matter. So if you look at the sun, uh, there's actually quite a bit of evidence that it's condensed matter. Now, everybody says it's a gaseous plasma, but the sun has a true surface. There's quite a bit of evidence for it. We do seismology on the sun, of course. The sun is ringing like a bell. It's hard to imagine that that can happen if the photosphere is at 10 to the minus 7 grams per centimeter cubed. Seismology, of course, is a science of condensed matter. And if a flare breaks through the surface of the sun, you clearly see waves just like you would on a pond and such waves have transverse components and of course that's another sign of condensed matter. The, the most important proof that the sun is condensed matter actually comes from the thermal spectrum. For those who are familiar with Kirchhoff's law, we go back in 1859 and Kirchhoff says that if you have a cavity, within that cavity the radiation will always be black independent of the nature of the walls. And uh, of course this is used in the black hole in the Hawking radiation. But the problem is, is that there is no physical proof of Kirchhoff's law. So Kirchhoff wrote his law in 1859, and he wrote it mathematically without experimental basis. And then uh, his law quickly uh, was challenged uh, theoretically, and no theoretical proof survived. In 1913, Hilbert actually gave a talk saying there's no valid proof of Kirchhoff's law. There are no valid theoretical proofs of Kirchhoff's law. Planck in his book, The Theory of Heat Radiation, actually tries to provide a proof of Kirchhoff's law. And uh, he does a very unusual thing in there because he uses polarized light and Brewster's law in order to try to get Kirchhoff's law. But of course, black body radiation is never polarized. So I wrote a paper uh, arguing that this theoretical proof of Kirchhoff's law is also invalid. Now, if you think of Kirchhoff's law, there are two extremes, the perfect absorber and the perfect reflector. And of course, in the perfect absorber, we have no problem. If you want to build a black body on Earth, we always use perfect absorbers. Now, in Planck's book, he used perfect reflectors, but he always inserted a little piece of graphite inside his perfect reflector. And of course, for Kirchhoff's law, the emission is going to be zero in a perfect reflector. So you're dividing by zero. So one of the limits of Kirchhoff's law doesn't hold. So there's no theoretical proof and there's no experimental proof of Kirchhoff's law. Now this is extremely important for the sun because in the sun we try to claim that we understand the thermal spectrum. We get the thermal spectrum because uh, going way back to the days of Eddington and beforehand we tried to use a summation of many processes to explain why we get a thermal spectrum. But from graphite, which is a known black body on Earth, there can only be one process, right? It's the vibration of a lattice field that produces this thermal spectrum. And the problem with the black hole, of course, is there is no lattice field, so how do you even get the Hawking radiation? So if you look at the sun, it has activity. And uh, currently, we are in an active phase where the equatorial region of the sun uh, becomes quite active and we see sunspots. And we have the well-known butterfly pattern on the sun. So at the beginning of activity, we find that if you count the sunspot area, uh, they tend to be at high latitudes, you know. The, the, the butterfly pattern starts high and then as the activity progresses, the butterfly pattern moves more towards the equator. So the question is, well, why is it that the sun actually has this activity? And I think that in the gas model, it's very hard to come up with an idea of why does the sun become active? Now, in the metallic hydrogen solar model, I've said that the sun has a hexagonal planar lattice. And the reason it does, there are many, many reasons, but the primary reason is that this enables us to have a black body spectrum. And uh, for those who studied solid state physics, I actually had correspondence with Neil Ashcroft before he died. He wrote uh, the famous book on solid state physics. And he actually sent me uh, an email saying that, uh, that, well, actually, one of the things he wrote was that he regretted that he never worked on a metallic sun uh, because he was an expert on liquid metallic hydrogen, on metallic hydrogen, 
Uh, he was a theoretical uh, physicist, and he spent his life working on metallic hydrogen. And he actually wrote that after reading my 40 proof paper, he actually regretted that he never tried to think about the sun being metallic hydrogen. So, and he also sent me in that paper a paragraph from one of his book chapters in which he says that this uh, structure, uh, the hexagonal planar structure for hydrogen, for metallic hydrogen, for semi-metallic hydrogen, will be very similar to graphite, which is what we want in optical properties. So, so Ashcroft had written this. And so now how about if we do have such a structure on the sun, one thing that's interesting about hexagonal planar structures in chemistry, and I'm an inorganic chemist by training, uh, but this idea actually came from one of my sons who's an anesthesiologist today uh, here in Michigan. But uh, the idea is that uh, it's well known in graphite that you can have intercalate regions. So between these planes, you can, you can put uh, non-hydrogen materials in the sun. So non-hydrogen elements can reside within these planes. And what I say is that you can get solar activity when the sun tries to degas these non-hydrogen elements. Now this is well known to occur in graphite. If you take a piece of graphite that's about a centimeter uh, thick and you saturate it and then you put it on a table, you saturate it uh, with a, or some gas and then you strike the table, graphite will expand a hundredfold. And what I've said is that this could be a mechanism of how stars become supernovas. You don't need a white dwarf. What you need is just a star that has an un in unstable interior, and then it can violently expand and, uh, and create a supernova. Or a, a red giant, if you have many, many layers that slowly expand, you can get a red giant out of the star. So in solar activity, what we have is that uh, these intercalate planes actually end up being pushed, the intercalate material push the planes uh, above the surface and then the material is released and, and we see uh, very high concentrations, for instance, of helium-3 in the sun with activity. So these are two things uh, from this paper. Uh, the hexagonal metallic hydrogen layered lattice could provide a powerful driving force for excluding heavier elements from the solar body. Here, herein lies a new exfoliative force to drive both surface activity and solar winds. And such lattice exclusion, which is known to occur in chemistry, and the possibility that stars might undergo processes like exfoliation could play a cru cr crucial role in at least five separate aspects of solar and stellar dynamics. It can supply the driving force for solar winds. It can generate the settings for flares, coronal mass ejections, and prominences. It can account for the 11-year cycle and provide an alternative explanation for planet and satellite formation. And it can explain the, the existence of red giants and supernova. So for planets, uh, what I'm saying is that when a star forms, uh, you have different material inside the, the star. And as you start forming a lattice, some material will be immiscible with that lattice and it gets expelled. So the idea of this talk, I received an email from a person that teaches uh, on how to fly 737s for Rainier in the United Kingdom. That's the first author. And uh, so he's a pilot to fly 737s. And he had this idea. He said, well, Pierre, couldn't this uh, occur because of the Debunikov effect. So this effect, uh, when you have a solid body rotation and you have uh, an intermediate axis which is unstable, uh, it can cause a flip of the axes. So here is a little model of the sun and you have the z-axis, let's say that the core of the sun is spinning. Now it's an interesting thing that uh, in the gaseous model of the sun, they still tell us that there's something inside it. But if it's a gaseous plasma, there can be nothing inside it. It's all a gas, right? But for my model, we have a true core. And uh, so there, there are accepted rotation rates for the, radiative, for the outer radiative zone and the core. This is a relatively new number. So in about nine days, according to this new number, the core is rotating. Now, so how do you get solid body rotation in a gas? Now, Ishimuru, who was an expert in 
high energy plasma physics and high density plasma physics actually proposed that the sun could have a metallic hydrogen core about 20 years ago before I came up with the idea that the sun was metallic hydrogen and then after I started working on it then I discovered his papers. So we say that the sun has a solid body core and it's rotating. Now when it rotates, this is not quite like this effect uh, because there in the Debandikov effect we just need the intermediate axis. In, in this case, we just want that the z-axis becomes unstable to rotation. And what causes that is that in the sun, there's a layer called the tachycline layer. Between uh, the solar core and the next shell, there's, there's actually shear forces there. And that, causes, that can cause the entire solar core to become unstable and, and destabilizes the axis. So as it starts spinning, all of a sudden, the, the z-axis can flip. And this can account for the inversion of polarity in the sun, which cannot be accounted for in the standard model. Now, there are two problems here. There's the rate of rotation of the core, and we also want to know what is the asymmetry of the core. And why is that? There are two unknowns, the 11-year cycle and then the strange one, the perihelion precession of Mercury. So for those who do relativity, you know that this is one of the proofs of general relativity. Now, before Einstein came out with this equation, Gerber had actually solved it in, uh, this is a typo up there, in 1898, Gerber had come up with the same expression. And Einstein said that he didn't need to cite Gerber, he didn't know about Gerber, and even if he had known about Gerber, he still didn't need to cite him. I disagree, he absolutely needed to cite him. So when you do science, I don't care what level you do it at, or where you learn something, you have to cite people. So there's uh, an example of Charles's law. And Charles's law in chemistry, Charles never wrote a darn thing. But somebody else said, oh, he did it, and so Charles got the credit for it. So knowing something is all that is required. Not even an abstract is required in science. It, it's based on our honesty. So, so that's why I disagree with Einstein. He did need to cite Gerber even if he disagreed with his methods. And so now we have general relativity solves this perihelion procession of mercury. But in solving it, the, as Einstein assumed that the sun had no distortion within its structure. OK? Now, what if there is a distortion? And uh, you can go back. Don't, you can go back to. Uh, Le Verrier. Le Verrier had, as you remembered, discovered the planet Neptune by looking at the precession of Uranus. He knew that there was a problem, so he postulated that Neptune had to be there, and that's how that planet was discovered. Now, Le Verrier also said that you can explain the perihelion precession of Mercury if there was an inner planet. So in the 1800s, people started looking for a planet called Vulcan that was rotating between Mercury and the Sun. Now, of course, Vulcan, the effect of Vulcan for Le Verrier, in modern terms, could be just that the Sun has an asymmetric core. So if the Sun has an asymmetric core, then we have these two problems that can be solved, right? We know the 11-year cycle. We, need, we have two unknowns. What is the real rate of rotation of the core, and what is its asymmetry? And where there's two things that we know. We know the 11-year cycle, and we know the perihelion precession of Mercury. So from these two knowns, we should be able to establish the amount of asymmetry in the solar core, and how, how much it's rotating, and therefore the inversion. So what's nice about this problem is that we solve two problems. We, we bring two problems together with one approach. And of course, the question is, why do we have a modern minimum? So what I say is that in this model, the sun goes active because it's degassing its non-hydrogen elements. The non-hydrogen elements are existing in intercalate zones, like we find in graphite. And then these get degassed when the sun goes active. So why did we have a minimum? So the same inversion of the core must be taking place. The z-axis must be taking place. But we never had activity. 
So what this leads you to think is that the sun was able to degas itself. So did the sun have something like a micronova event before the modern minimum that we didn't detect here on Earth? Of course, this was in the Middle Ages, right? So if the sun degassed on an axis and we got lucky and it went away from us, we would have never known that it degassed and then we got the modern minimum. So, uh, so this is just to present a new idea that we have a solid solar core and that this has consequences. And one of the consequences is that we could now, with this approach, explain the 11-year cycle of the sun and the perihelion of Mercury by linking these two problems together. Thank you very much.